hold on. Can you hear Jackson? Can you hear my son screaming right now? I'm going to edit this part out, but can you hear him? I cannot hear him. Uh-uh. Okay, good. Okay, we'll yeah. edit this. <laughs> but he is screaming. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you might hear a little puppy in the background too. So there we go. Okay, okay, that's good. All right, so sorry, we're going to jump back in. But I was like, hold on a minute. This is just, this is too much. Hey there, my name is Erin Deal, and I'm a half Southern, half Midwestern mama, some call this voice a nasal twang, who took $5,000 to build and scale a one of a kind experiential organization that improves the lives of corporate professionals through personal development, humanity, and humor. Along the way, I've built client relationships with some of the most notable companies in the country, all while attracting a rock star team of experts and hilarious facilitators. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, what I didn't tell you is that my resume also includes a long list of comedy shows I bombed, improv teams I didn't make, companies who told me no, and many a heartache when it came to becoming a mother. I want to show you the real deal of the grit, creativity, and determination it takes to overcome your disappointments, embrace the suck, and design the career you could only dream about. I believe we all have our own unique gifts that we bring to the world, and it is our mistakes that help to unwrap them. Welcome to Failed It. What up, Failed It family? It's time for your Failed It fam member of the week. Maybe I thought I would try something different today and wrap our reviewer. Okay, this comes from 210Common. All right, that's our user, 210Common. And their review starts with relatable, honest, inspiring. Here we go. I'm about to drop a beat. I'm new to the podcast world, but what a way to start my newest obsession. That doesn't rhyme. The content is so relatable, honest, and inspiring. Thank you. You guys, I'm going to not quit my day job. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to keep running and prove it and talking to you in my podcast closet. But 210 Common. Thank you so much for this review. Welcome to the podcast world. We are honored that we are your entry into this lovely platform. And we'd love to thank you for it. So send us an email at info at learn to improve it.com. We're going to hook you up with one of our e-learning courses we called Improve Use. We have 10 of them available and you can choose from anything that speaks to you like networking, thinking quickly on your feet. Um, we've got a variety. So you pick yours that speaks to you the most. We'll send it to you and you get them every week for three weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, straight to your inbox, audio PDFs, and a worksheet of learning all to help you enhance the soft skill of your choice. Failed at family, you know what I'm going to say. If you could leave us a review on iTunes. I will literally give you a hug. And then if we ever meet in person, which I hope we do one day, when that day comes and we can be safe, I hope I can do that. But my point to you is <laughs> I would greatly appreciate it. So would our team. We work really hard behind the scenes giving you this content each week. And your review helps us share this message with more people in the U.S., all over the world. We've got listeners from everywhere coming in now. So we're so excited about that. If you drop us a review, we're going to read a review a week from the Failed It fam and then provide you with one of our e-learning courses as a way to say thank you. My friends, my Failed It family, you've heard it here. Now, let's get into today's episode. Let's go, baby. All right. Okay. Failed It family, today I am so jazzed. I have jazz hands. I cannot wait to introduce you to my guest, my friend, Rich Robles, to our show. Welcome, Rich. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. What an introduction. Thank you for having me here today. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm so excited. We're going to jump into all things failing it in just a minute. But before we do, I have to share with our Failed It family all of your highlights because you are a very successful person. So let's discuss 
the successes of Rich Robles. So Rich is a Senior Director of Diversity Inclusion at Novant Health. In his role, Rich leads strategies and work that create a culture where people feel included, engaged, and have a sense of belonging while achieving Novant's health's goals. Now, Rich's uh, background includes both consulting and internal roles in the areas of organizational development, cultural transformation, merger integration, and change management. Now, he's led work for companies such as Motorola, Pepsi, McDonald's, Chicago Tribune, and Exelon, which, by the way, Rich, those are some of my clients. Anyway, Rich worked at Bank of America, where he held roles responsible for organizational design, culture change, and team effectiveness. Now, prior to Navant, he was a senior consultant at the Center for Intentional Leadership, where he helped clients create high-performing teams and cultures. Now, Rich, you've received an, a master's degree with honors in industrial and organizational psychology from Roosevelt in Chicago and a BA degree in psychology from Huntington University. He is committed to the Hispanic community in Charlotte, and he has recently been appointed to the Governor's Advisory Council for Hispanic Latino Affairs. Now, additionally, Rich is a board member of the Urban Promise and the Latin America Chamber of Commerce. Charlotte. Rich grew up in Guatemala City, where he attended a military school before moving to the U.S. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and four daughters. And in his rare moments of spare time, he enjoys anything related to his favorite soccer team, FC Barcelona, traveling to other countries and summers at the beach with his family. Rich, welcome again to the show. (laughs) Thank you, Erin. Wow, that was a lot of information. Let's go. <laughs> You're like, when do we talk about how I suck now, right? No. no. <laughs> but we have that link. That's right. We, I forgot that you and I are, you know, from Chicago, so to speak. Yeah. That's what I was going to share with our, we call our audience the failed it family. So I, I want to share that little insight with them, Rich, because you and I met three years ago in Charlotte. We connected, I think, through LinkedIn, and then we met in person back when you could actually meet in person. And yep. yep, And we realized that we were both from Chicago. And then I realized you had fulfilled your dreams of snowless springs and you moved South to Charlotte and you were my Southern inspiration because I'm in, I'm in Charlotte now. Yes, exactly. And that was, that was before you had a baby and you were getting a lot of sleep. <laughs> and ain't that the truth these are not shopping sprees under my eyes these are real bags people real bags under the eyeballs i love this I've, i'm so happy to, that we a connected b i'm so happy to have you here on the show rich you and i talked before we hit record and let's just share with the audience because This is a vulnerable thing that we're asking you to do, to come on the show, to talk about your fails. Talk to me about how you're feeling right now. Oh, like I told you, this is scary because no one has ever asked me before, why don't you come in and, you know, share your failures with hundreds of people and talk to them about where you have really sucked in your, you know, your professional life. No one talks about this. And it's, yeah, I don't know if it's a taboo. I don't know if we're all not comfortable being vulnerable, but that's really the journey I've been on for the last, oh man, I don't know, six, seven years, learning more about who am I. But when I ask myself, who am I? I can't just think about the good things. I also have to think about what has shaped me, who I am today. And to be honest, it's in those valleys of my own life journey where I've, I think I've learned the most. So when I was reflecting about the questions that you were, you know, you had sent me about today, it's like, no, the biggest lessons came from those moments when I failed. Yeah. And that's, that's what this show is all about. And I appreciate your vulnerability and sharing that you're nervous because we have people from the corporate world. We have entrepreneurs, we have comedians come on this show and Everybody has a different mindset, and I know a lot of people listening can probably um, sympathize and empathize with you that if they were asked to come do this, they would also feel some hesitation. So we're going to we're gonna tread as lightly or go as deep as you want to go, Rich, today, because this is your, your show. I'm just here for it, all right? So 
I I want to start in in sort of the beginning where I know well not the beginning. Let's start back to you being in Chicago. What made you to move to Charlotte first of all? And you might hear my assistant in the background today, filled it fam. Um, he's waking up. He's eighteen months, and so I, my my podcasting closet sits close to his bedroom. So here we are. This is real. This is real, Rich. Um, okay. So what brought you? from Chicago to Charlotte. By the way, I get it being real because it is Friday afternoon when we're recording this and my kids know that it's Friday. You know, we're approaching Friday night, which is movie and pizza night in our family. So you're going to hear my kids in the background. I love it. That's it. And everybody listening, if you're on your commute or taking a walk, this is real life. You know, we're just going to share it. We're just going to share. Okay. So tell us how you got from Chicago to Charlotte. Yeah, so when I was in Chicago, uh, I was working for an organization called Archstone Consulting, and I was doing mergers and acquisitions, restructuring for pharmaceutical companies in the East Coast. And so my life consisted of leaving early, uh, Monday mornings, leaving early Monday mornings, taking a flight from uh, at O'Hare and landing in Newark sometime mid morning. And then catching a flight back, hopefully on a Thursday night, but a lot of times the flights will get canceled or delayed. I wouldn't get home until Friday night. Sometimes I remember getting home Saturday mornings. Mm. So between Newark and New, you know, New Jersey, it, it, was, it took a lot of my time being away from home. At that time, my wife and I had two daughters. And I just found myself in a space where, wow, I did. this is not what I dreamed it would be like when I was, you know, how, when I was thinking about having a family, dreaming about that. Because at best, I was a part-time dad, not even a part-time husband to my wife. And so we were now looking for something different. And that's when the Bank of America kept knocking and uh, invited me to be part, you know, considering a role in moving to Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So Bank of America brought you to Charlotte. And then what what I want to know, because I just did this recently. Inquiring minds want to know what brought what was your mentality shift coming from because I know you lived in Evanston and Chicago, but you still had that city around you. And Charlotte's a wonderful city too. But what was your mindset? What did you have to shift mentally in your brain coming from Chicago to Charlotte? To be honest, Aaron, they were all good things uh, because You know, people, I remember people saying, oh, my commute is 30 minutes. I was like, my commute in Chicago sometimes was an hour and a half each way when I had to go and see local clients. So weather-wise, traffic-wise, where my office was, uptown, it was the best of the best. You know, as far as, you know, I would say changes that I had to make, it's not like we have 20 restaurants that, you know, specialize in Cantonese food. You know, we might have one or two, but they're really good here. So I have yet to want something from Chicago that I haven't been able to find here. So, you know, the shifts that we had to make were in a positive way. I don't remember, you know, I remember still being scared because we were in the South and it was a different culture and environment, but we adapted very quickly because, you know, here it's a it's a welcoming culture too yeah no and i i totally you know empathize with that and i think the south has changed a lot in the in the over the past few years especially like with all of the work that you've been doing and all the good you put in the world when you're moving from some a bigger city to a city charlotte's still a big city your mindset has to shift you have to shift and then you jumped right into a role with bank of america and you were in organizational development and learning and development so what would you say your main focus of l and d was when when you were in that position yeah the focus was you know number 1 to manage the different restructures that were happening within bank of america so at the time it was 300 plus 300 plus, 300,000 plus employees at Bank of America, large, large organization. And there were a lot of changes going within the bank. Uh, They were not acquiring any more organizations from the outside. But I remember, you know, managing the mergers of large businesses just within, you know, know, one division of the bank. We were also, you know, the role also included work and leadership development. And that meant managing our top performers, building succession plans for uh, critical roles at the bank, 
as well as managing the entire performance management system. And so how do we identify emerging leaders within the business? That is, that's a big role to fill. Okay, that's just a few things, a few things. Let me ask you this. If you were to pinpoint a major lesson learned through a failure, here we go, Rich, we're, we're dipping a toe into the failure. If you were to pinpoint one of your biggest fails as a leader in that role, what would it be? Mm. This is the part, the part where you might have to edit my pause here. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when I think of, I think back about Bank of America and the fails in that role. So one thing that I had a shift when I went from managing something at the corporate level, so a centralized office, to be in inside one of our businesses. And I went in thinking strategy. I went in thinking, how do we restructure this to work better? And something that I failed to do at that point, looking back, is I did not sit down with my client internally and ask my client, listen, tell me about what you're dreaming. Tell me about the challenges that you have. I went in thinking what they wanted was a subject matter expert, and I left behind the thing I'm very good at, which is building relationships, understanding my clients, which I do now. But back then, just being green in that role, oh, that I failed miserably because those first two months were just hard because I was not connecting to my leaders. And the reason why I was connect, not connecting with my leaders is because I felt the pressure to come across as professional, to the pressure to come across as a subject matter expert. And I am here to add value and you're going to love me. But I failed to be, get connected at the human level with my clients. So looking back, of course, you know, that's something that I'm like, <laughs> I'm never going to do that again. What was I thinking? And very quickly, of course, my mentors and people around me said, Rich, uh, you need to have a different approach on this. This is not working. You know, it's not something that you're doing company wide. This is for a specific business. Get to know the business at the detail level and get to know your client. That I would say that's one of the biggest things that looking back, I'm like, oh, how did I miss that? Uh, that is, first of all, amazing that you have the the sort of bird's eye view now to look at and see that, right? So, and thanks for sharing that, Rich. Did that feel good? Did that get feel good to get a fail out there? Tell me how you feel. I did. It's just, you know, it's really, it's part of my story. And if, <laughs> if I don't share it, I know I share my stories with my kids. I'm like, why am I not sharing these things out loud? Because I wish I knew this about other people who I see, wow, they're so successful. But to get to something, you have had to fail or had a bump in the road or a major, you know, you fell flat on your face kind of things. Yeah. So you realized from that role, you were essentially more transactional in your approach to leadership development than you wish an organizational development than you want it to be. So then you left Bank of America, you did some work in consulting, and now you've been at Novant Health, which is one of the largest healthcare providers in, in the Southeast and maybe the country. Am I, am I right in saying that? For the past three and a half years, you've been in this diversity and inclusion role. I want to dive into that because not only are you at the center of the pandemic we're all facing in healthcare, so at a major healthcare organization, but you're also at the center of this social and racial injustice that we as a nation are experiencing. And you are a leader in, in, in the DNI space for this organization. What has this past year and a half been? It's not even been a year and a half, Rich. It feels like a year and a half. What has this past <laughs> sort of year been like for you? Can you share with us what, what you felt and some of the things in this leadership capacity you've had to deal with? Yeah, first of all, you're right. It feels like we've been here a long, long time. And, you know, in March, it will be a year that we've been in, under this pandemic. And then what we're calling, you know, labeling civil unrest, but it's really racial inequalities that we have been more aware of as a country. So nothing in the world, I don't know if anybody would raise their hand and say, oh, I was prepared for this. I don't know that anybody was prepared to see and experience what we saw last year and what we are still experiencing in our country. So some of the things that I felt was at first, 
like, wow, this is overwhelming. How do we begin to even peel back the layers of some of the the topics, the themes, but also the emotions of what different people are feeling, whether you're a person of color, whether you're a person with a different ability, whether you're a person with a different sexual orientation or gender identity, they, you know, we all had different feelings and they, we all wanted just to have a seat at the table and let that be equal to everyone and equitable to everyone. So <laughs> different emotions for me, it was frustrating being a person from Guatemala, being a Latin American, you know, leader, but also just a, you know, a Latino guy who lives in Charlotte. What is my role in all of this? And how do I feel? Do I, what are my emotions? Can I actually, do I write him down? Do I tell someone about how I'm feeling? It is frustrating that at times it's anger and at times it's just frustration and even finding the words to say to others. So many things that I, you know, I began feeling in March and then in June. Mm -hmm. Oh, Rich, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I shared this on an, a podcast we just released um, prior to your episode going, but it's almost, here. here's just an analogy story that I've, that I've sort of dealt with on my own. I was changing my son on just changing his diaper. Okay. We're, t we're going from DNI to changing a diaper, but I promise there's a loophole back to where I'm going here. So I was changing him and he was holding this hard copy book and he hit me in the face with this hard copy book. It was good night moon. Okay. So I got good night moon right to the eyeball. So automatically I start crying because it hurt. It hurt so bad. And then he sees me cry and he starts crying. So then I'm sitting there holding my son and trying to be there for him when he's the reason why I'm crying, <laughs> which is this full <laughs> circle parenting moment, which made me realize that not only you are in such a space, you're, you're a leader of a healthcare organization, but you are also processing what's happening to you in real time. And in real time, you are also supposed to be the person to hold others and lift them up and help them through it. So you personally, Rich, people in general, leaders, leaders in HR, leaders in general, parents, we've all had to take on this responsibility of trying to uplift others through this when we're all processing it at the same time. So, I mean, kudos to you because you've had you have a large, large organization to help and you have four daughters and you have, you know, your own internal processes that you're trying to figure out and work through. So thanks for sharing that. And I hope that story makes sense. Um, I went from, I went from B and I to diapers. That's what we just did there. You know what? No, but that's the thing, Erin. Imagine if someone had come at that moment, another adult and say, Erin, whoa, you just got hit with a book. Why, first of all, how are you feeling? What's making you cry? Yeah. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, you know, like you were saying, being able to uplift others, I think most of the time what we are craving is someone to just come next to us and say, boy, that really stinks. That really sucks. And just exercise lots of empathy and say, you know, I'm sorry. Is there something I can do for you? But even just simply asking, how are you doing? I remember one of my colleagues saying, one day you called me and just asked me how I was doing and how I'm processing. He's like, and she said, no one has asked me that before in mm. the last month. And I thought, oh, you know, I think that's at the end of the day, we just want someone who's checking up on us, checking in on us or, and asking us, how are, no, really, how are you doing? Just uh, so, that, so that we can just say it all out loud. You know what? It really, it really hurt that my son, I'm trying to read a book and it hit me and now I'm crying because it's painful, but also emotional and you just get it out. And once you get it out, it's like, a, you know, like a kid is taking, you know, like, I want ice cream and started yelling. They want ice cream. I said, no. Okay. All right. I won't have ice cream. You know, it goes away. Yeah. That's Momentarily. so true. Yeah. Uh, I love that. And I, th I think that it's such an easy thing to do as a leader is to ask your team, how are you doing? And we forget in the moment, we just something so simple, but you're right. In that, in that parenting moment, all I would have wanted was for my mom or my husband to come in and been like, are you okay? And just having that resource. So question for you, have you, since you're a resource for so many, have you 
got any type of resources on your end to help with your mental health while you're struggling and going through all of this as well and trying to help others. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you know what, this is something that my wife and I began thinking about the, uh, about the, about in March and April, because quickly we noticed that, whoa, being at home with now we have four daughters, everyone on school needing our attention. We're going to need some breaks. So for our own mental health, we came up with a schedule. So Tuesday nights is my night off and Thursday nights is her night off. We can do whatever we want, knowing that we can't leave the house because, you know, we're all quarantining and staying home. So what I decided is that I call my best friend who lives in Chicago and we had been talking about playing games. And I'm like, wait, what if we find a video game we can both play online? We've never done anything like it before. So we figure out how to put our playstations on a network and this is exactly what i do every tuesday night my family knows and for over the last eight to nine months tuesday nights nights with brad and so that's what i do i play video games with my friend i'm in my you know on my age <laughs> i'm a grown man playing video <laughs> games with my friend and having adventures in that virtual world but that's my you know one way that i get to escape and have some mental health i know tuesday nights that's what i get to do Friday nights are our family. It's, as I mentioned, it's, you know, pizza and movie night. My wife either makes the pizza, which is the best pizza ever. Of course, I'm biased. Or we buy it. But, you know, that's the thing that we get to do on Friday nights, Saturday mornings. I love doing breakfast for my family. And I get up and I do pancakes. That hasn't changed. And so I wanted mm -hmm. our kids and I wanted ourselves to know that, yes, this pandemic is it's hard. But some things we can, you know, we can keep as the things that we do as a family, but, you know, having those breaks, I know that sounds very simple, but that's something that I, I did for myself for health check or men, uh, personal health and uh, self-care. The other piece that I did was, okay, someone at the beginning of the pandemic sent an email and at the end of the email had a hashtag, don't waste the pandemic. And this is in March. It had just started. I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever read in an email. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't let go of the hashtag. And I said, maybe they're onto something here. So if I didn't waste the pandemic, what would I do? Well, I've always wanted to drink more water. So I just got really practical, downloaded one of those apps where you can see the progress of water you drink during the day. And I started drinking water. And to this day, I drink a lot of water. But it's just a way of giving myself a you know, a daily challenge. It's not a burden. It's just something fun for me to do. And I'm just competing against myself, no one else. So little things like that have been really good and mm. keeping that and, and friends. I do have two friends that I call and I said, you won't believe what I heard today. You know, or I said, that was so frustrating and they don't have an answer. They just, you know, again, going back to say, man, that sounds really hard. You know, who else are you talking to? That's it. Mm, I love it. And that's something Oh man, now you make me want to do like a pancake morning. I pictured pancakes and syrup. Like you gave me a visual there of like butter mm -hmm. dripping down the pancakes. This pizza. Listen, when I come to Charlotte, we're going to have to talk about that. This is very interesting because I think a lot of times we forget as parents, as leaders, that we have to put on our own oxygen mask first before we can help others. It's that airplane analogy. It's that, you know, fill your tea kettle first before you can pour tea in somebody else's cup, you know, like it's, mm. it's so important. And I'm so glad you shared that. And I hope people listening can take some of those and apply them in a way that fits their own life because it's so important right now. Mental health is so important. And if it's even, I love the Tuesday night, like you get your night to yourself. I, that is something I think more people could lean into if you have getting kids or, you know, you're a workaholic and you don't give yourself that time away, schedule that time. That's what you're doing. You're scheduling that time for yourself. I love that, Rich. Hey, Failed It fam. Are you a leader for a small or large team that's stuck working from home? Are you missing the in-office happy hours or training sessions that allow people to interact and get to know each other? Are you sick of staring at a spreadsheet and you want something that will not only enhance team morale, but also build soft skills? Then Improve It has your back. 
we've pivoted all 11 of our in-person soft skill training workshops to this virtual environment. Using Zoom, we'll create a memorable hour and a half experience that can train your team on things like effective communication, leadership, thinking quickly on your feet, presentation skills, and networking all in this virtual environment. Leading a team of interns, let us wow them with our Career 101 workshop. Leading a sales team who's figuring out how to cold call or even warm call in this virtual world, have our team of improv professionals facilitate our sales training workshop. If this is the spice that your team needs to get out of this work from home rut, email us at info at learn to improve it.com. Again, that's info at learn to improve it.com. And that's T O improve it.com. Or you can head to our website, learn to improve it.com to learn more. We would love to help you improve your it virtually, whatever your it might be. Let me ask you this, going from a high to a low, what was your biggest 2020 fail? So one thing that I wanted to do in 2020 is based on that quote that I had actually read when I was at Bank of America, someone was doing us one of those webinars on, you know, work-life balance. And one of the quotes that I saw on the screen was, we have figured out how to answer emails on a Friday night, Saturday night, but we haven't figured out how to go to the movies on a Monday afternoon. Mm. And I thought, man, I'm going to try to figure that out. Now that I'm home and I'm, you know, I have to work from home, I'm going to spend a lot more time with my kids. This is just a given. Guess what? It didn't happen. It didn't. In fact, I was working more hours in front of my computer in my bedroom. And when I, you know, I asked my kids, okay, what else can I be doing? I asked them that question, you know, how can I be a, a better dad for you? What can I be doing be- and different? He said, dad, And they they told me this, you know, even the other night, it's like, yeah, sometimes you're not available as much as you think you are just because you're home. You know, part of me internally is like, no, no, I'm not. I'm I'm available. I am. I play (laughs) games with you all. You know, outside I'm going, oh, my goodness. It doesn't matter what I think. It's how they perceive it that, you know, and how how I've come across them. So that to me was a big fail for 2020 that. I did not get to spend time with my kids as much as I wanted to. We used to take our kids, you know, our daughters out on dates every week. And we will take, my wife and I will take turns. I'll tell you, I probably had one day with them last last year. I'm like, so if I have this Tuesday night with my friend, am I sending a good message to my daughters that I'm not spending intentional time with them? Yes, it is. So that is something that is, you know, I am going to fix this year. I love it. And I mean, it sounds like you are just bored, though. You weren't really, you know, helping your company survive our pandemic or, you know, working through the unrest of our nation here with racial injustice. It was you were just sitting around just looking at your computer, not hanging out. You had you had some <laughs> shoes to fill, Rich. You were you were help you're a hero, essentially, in so many ways. So I I appreciate you sharing that. And I know you'll you'll change that. It's hard to to admit those things sometimes. But I love what you said too. It's not what I think, it's how they perceive it. And that's really what I think the basis of all of this is, is how do we make other people feel, right? How do we show up and make people feel heard? So I'm gonna ask you a little, a little another deeper question there. You have those four daughters. I'm gonna start a GoFundMe for all of the weddings that you will have to pay for now. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Um, <laughs> Bless up, Rich. That's that's a lot. Oh. You know what's coming. Those big bills are coming. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, as you know, a woman myself, I well, I'm I'm praying for you. I'm sending prayers. Um, but if you could tell your daughters any piece of advice that you learned through some of your biggest fails, if you could speak directly to them, what would you say? Oh, I, I I love this question because I am. This is one thing I'm I'm very present to, and that it's learn and embrace who you are and be that. And here I'll explain what I mean by that because that sounds very cliche. You know, be yourself. It's beyond that. So when I left Bank of America, I went to work for the Center for Intentional Leadership, as you mentioned. And on my first day, my new boss at the time, who became you know my boss, but also my my executive coach. 
he uh, introduced me to some people that first day. And he said, by the way, this is Rich. Please say hello. He just joined us today. He's from Guatemala. That's all he said. And these were prospective clients. And he didn't say, hey, by the way, he has a you know a background in restructuring and, and leadership development. Nothing. On Wednesday of that same week, I was in the back of the room taking notes in a large uh, team setting. And he paused and said, by the way, I want to introduce you to Rich. He just joined our firm this week. Please say hello to Rich. He's from Guatemala. I'm like, boy, that's really weird. He didn't say anything else. He just said that. He said it on Friday again. And at that time, I'm like, wait a minute. Why is he saying that? And so I went up to him to him, and I said, Mike, why are you telling people I am from Guatemala? And he just looked me in the eyes and said, because you don't, and you need to find out why. And I said, no, I do. I tell, wait, oh, I guess I don't. Why is that? And so I remember, then I had to go back into the times when I got to the United States as a teenager, watching, you know, being in Guatemala, watching American movies. All I wanted to be was an American teenager and be, be all that. And I think I begin to turn off some things about me that are about being from Guatemala to the point that I turn, I try to turn everything off without knowing it. Mm. And so I tell that story to my daughters because it was until now, later in life, I'm, you know, I talk about it very freely and now I know what it means. I embrace and I value who I am, but I wish I would have done that sooner when I was in my twenties, you know, uh, early twenties when I was in college, even you all the way back. So I tell my daughters, you know, know who you are, embrace who you are and just be that because that's what the world really needs. People who can be themselves. And, you know, we, we throw this buzzword around, like be vulnerable, but what be, being vulnerable means learn to talk about you, the good and the bad. So this is what I'm exercising today, you know, and talking about failures, but that I would say that's the biggest lesson that I have learned later in life that I wish I had learned before that I talk to my daughters about very often, uh, especially our, you know, our daughters who are 16 and 14, you know, learning about who are they, how do they fit in the social circles that they are in and who are they, who do they represent? And they ask me questions about, dad, are, are we Latina girls or are we, you know, my wife is from Michigan, Western side of Michigan. It's a Dutch community, so to speak. And everyone in her family, they're tall and blonde and blue eyes. So, our daughters don't look anything like me or like her. So they're asking themselves questions about who they are and where do they fit? What box do they check when they have to check who they are? Mm. And so I talk about them this quite often. I This is one of the best stories I've ever heard on this show. I'm not going to lie. If you're a past guest listening, you did a great job. I just want to give Rich some love right now. This is, I am literally sitting here and I have tears in my eyes. That is beautiful. I think that people listening, if you can resonate with that at all, there's there's so many people out there right now who heard that story and received it. Reg, that is honestly one of the best stories I have heard and the best answers to that question I've heard. So thank you for sharing that. And I hope your daughters listen to this one day and they hear that advice from you and just remember that where it came from is a good place. That's so cool. I, I, fr I freaking love that. Have you ever told that leader who told you that you don't talk about it, uh, that story? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he knows and he knows the impact that it's had on me. So he, after I left and uh, I went to work for Novan Health, of, yeah, he and I have kept in touch. We're good friends. And I show him, you know, I, I remember one time I pulled up a picture of you know, our daughters and my wife. He knows him very well. And I said, look at this picture. I want you to look at this picture. They have a better dad, a better human being around them because of the influence you've had on me. So thank you. Because you oh. you helped me see something I didn't see before about myself. Oh, my God. There's people get a Kleenex, Rich. This is... <laughs> It's just asking the question. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, that is amazing. And the world needs more leaders like that all around us. That is a beautiful, beautiful story. And I appreciate you as a leader sharing that with us. Let me ask you this question. Staying on our failure theme, Rich, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? 
boy, I dream about this. I want to hire like 20 people who want to do this work, want to change the world one conversation at a time and help people just voice it and be themselves. And let's go change it. You know, I want to change the world and starting in this city, there's so much work to do. That's, you know, I love what I'm doing today and I love my company and work, my team, you know, I love them. So it's not I'm looking to leave, but if, you know, if I hadn't the proverbial magical one, I would just bring 20 people with me. Let's go. Let's go change. Let's have the conversations, help people voice who they are so that they can know, you know what, there's hope. And in spite of all the painful things that we're hearing and reading and tweeting and and seeing on Instagram and everywhere and on the news, there's still hope. But that, that only comes from us saying something positive, us saying this was painful for me to to hear and come around each other and say, yeah, that sounds painful. That's what we need more of. Someone who can, act, you know, flex the empathy muscle and, and listen and say, okay, how, what can we do to change this? That's, that's what I want to do. Yes. You are a hope dealer. That's what you are. Hope dealer. I love it. I love that. Okay. Let me ask you another failure question. What did you fail at today, Rich? Oh, my daughter <laughs> asked me, hey, dad, can you keep, because she knew I had a break between 9.30 and 10 a.m. And <laughs> I said, yes, of course. And at 9.30, a meeting popped in my screen. And so I said to my daughter, honey, is it possible that we can move it to 11 a.m.? She's like, oh, sure. No, no problem. She's very flexible. She knows that. But I failed in keeping my promise that I would be available to her at 9.30. Oh, well, that's, you know what? You're learning. We're all learning from that mistake, but failures are <laughs> part of this process, Rich. Okay, so you have given us so many great, juicy chicken nuggets of wisdom here, and I am so grateful to you. There's one thing that we have left to do, and this is called the Fail Yeah Lightning Round. Rich, this is super easy. It's super fun. It's a little bit of improv, a little thinking quickly on your feet. You're going to nail it. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You're going to respond with a one-word answer, and if you say more than one word, I'm going to give you a Fail Yeah, just like that, like (laughs) Fail Yeah. All right. Okay? This is it. You can do it. Are you ready for the Fail Yeah Lightning Round? Let's go, Erin. All right, one word to describe your early career. Passionate. One word to describe where you're currently at in your career. Curious. One word to describe your future self. Peaceful. Oh, I love that word. Okay, one word to describe your favorite boss. Positive. One word to describe your least favorite boss. Micromanager. One word to describe your parenting style. I'll let you go with that one. It was a hyphen. That's fair. Okay. One word to describe your parenting style. Present. One word to describe your work from home fashion style. Casual. <laughs> and one word to describe this interview. Inspirational. Yes, Rich. Okay. But not for me, from you. Like the questions that you're asking me, are making me reflect. So I'm not coming across, oh, I'm inspiring. I was like, you're a- you're asking me the right questions to think through like, oh my gosh, all right, I've got some work to do, but this is inspiring me to do something bigger like with my time. And so this has been inspirational to me uh, <sighs> having this discussion and the questions that you're asking. See, that's the full circle effect because you're inspired. I'm inspired by you. And now you're inspiring our audience. So look at that. There's some inspiration station going on over here. But I, I, I appreciate that, Rich. And I, I'm so proud of you. You were nervous to come on and look what you did. You just shared some awesome insight with our audience. They are going to love it. Tell the Failed It family where they can find you on any social platform or they wanted to ask you a question. Where should they go? Absolutely. The easiest way you can find me is on LinkedIn. So just look for me, Rich Robles. You type it in and it comes up. You'll see me from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So please get in touch. You're welcome to message me anytime. I get a lot of messages and questions from people. I'm happy to engage in conversations uh, because I learn from, you know, what people, the questions people ask help me think through different ways. I love it. 
We'll link to your LinkedIn. We'll link to your LinkedIn in the show notes. Um, But Rich, uh, thank you so stinking much for bringing your voice, your talents, your wisdom. And I can tell you for a fact that the Failed It fam is going to get so much from this episode and from hearing your story. So thank you for the work that you're doing in this world. Thank you for for being in healthcare, for being in the DNI space, and for sharing all of your fails with us here today. And to the Failed It fam, fail, yeah, fail, freaking yeah. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to Failed It. I'm so happy you're along for the ride. And if you enjoyed today's show, head on over to iTunes to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every Wednesday. I'll see you next week, but want to leave you with this thought. What will you fail at today? And how will that help your future successful self? Think about it. I'm proud of you and you are totally failing it. See you next time. 